will have the overview of various endodontic conditions which can uh, be asked in the exam. So the most frequently asked topics we are discussing first is the internal resorption. When I say that internal resorption that means that the tooth is resolved from inside. So from pulp towards the outside it is being resolved. Now there is another type of resorption known as the ex external resorption in which the tooth is being resolved from outside. So from enamel or cemented towards the pulp. So this is the basic difference. But radiographically, uh, it is very difficult to differentiate if the both the walls are totally uh, engaged in this. That means from pulpal side towards the outer side, if it is complete resorption, it is very difficult to diagnose whether it is external resorption or internal resorption radiographically. So internal resorption, which is also known as pink tooth of memory, very important for the exam point of view. Then odontoclastoma these are the two names which are given to the in internal resorption why we call it pink tooth of memory because due to the uh, resorption the pulp is visible more the resorption is there the thinning will be there and thinning of the outer enamel will be there and the pulp will be seen from the outside that's why the tooth color becomes pink so that's why we call it pink tooth of memory now the etiology of this condition is not exactly known but it is thought that uh, suppose this is the tooth and we have the pulp here. Now there is trauma, any trauma or any bacterial infection or any other stimulus that will be causing inflammation. So there will be inflammatory cells inside the pulp chamber. Since the wall is closed, these cells the inflammatory cells are thought to evolve into the osteoclast and they start resorbing the tooth from inside making the pulp chamber larger 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 and finally this comes out from here so this is what we call as the internal resorption of the tooth so this is basically uh, usually asymptomatic but it can also be symptomatic if the inflammation from here goes to the periodontal ligament. So if the infection or the internal resorption or inflammatory cells goes to the periodontal ligament, they may further cause the pain also. Crack tooth syndrome, as the name itself indicates that the crack tooth is there and the symptoms are due to this particular syndrome. So the typical thing about this crack tooth syndrome is when you relieve the pressure, uh, generally the pressure is applied on that tooth, uh, patient is asked to bite through that tooth and we put a device called frack finder or some tooth slot uh, between the occlusion. So when the patient relieves its occlusion then pain occurs. Why does it this happen? Because there is a fractured tooth segment and we apply the pressure that fractured segment flare away and that will increase the volume of pulp hence decrease the pressure inside the pulp. When it is removed the fracture segment again come to uh, their original po um, position and that will increase the pressure in the pulp and the nerves will be stimulated leading to pain. So the typical thing about the crack tooth uh, syndrome is that if the pressure is relieved there will be pain and this is typical to this particular syndrome and asked in exam many times. So pain is elicited typically when the biting force is relieved. Now what we are using, what device we are using, there are two important devices which are the latest one, tooth slot or frack finder other device which are used for diagnosing crack tooth syndrome and we have other devices like rubber disc, bite block, cotton applicator, these are also can be used for finding out the crack tooth syndrome. Now when we talk about the cracks in tooth, there are basically many types of cracks which can occur inside the tooth. So first is craze lines. So craze lines are simple fractures or we can't say these are the actual fractures. They are just uh, limited to the enamel and they are not uh, going towards the dentin. So not involving dentin means the dentin tubules are still intact and they are not opened. Hence there won't be any symptoms. So asymptomatic will be the tooth. Why these craze lines can occur? These are occurring naturally or sometimes due to the traumatic forces or occlusal forces. So if it is due to the occlusal forces, then it is so short that the posterior teeth are having more occlusal forces than the anterior teeth. So it will be more common in the posterior teeth than the anterior teeth. So these are the cracks which are limited to enamel but do not extend into the dentin. May develop either naturally or after the trauma and are more prone uh, posterior teeth are more prone than the anterior teeth for such craze lines. 
it is not associated with any symptom and hence no treatment is required but if it is in the anterior segment we should see the aesthetic point of view and aesthetic aspect can be uh, cleared by uh, applying composite or tooth color restorations then we have the second one that is the fracture fractures or cracks cracks which have entered dentin and also involving the marginal ridges remember they are not only involving the dentin but also involve the marginal ridges of the tooth and these are known as the fractures and they can be found by trans illumination or by applying the dyes now the third type of crack we see in the tooth is split tooth when i say split tooth that simply means that the fracture runs fracture line runs from one surface of the tooth towards the second surface of the tooth and tooth is divided into two segments so this is basically known as the split tooth that the single tooth has split it into two parts now the treatment uh, depends treatment of this fracture root tooth suppose this is a tooth and this is the alveolar bone this is its socket so the treatment plan will depend on the amount of bone and the position of fracture line if the fracture line is running above the bone level then we'll be removing the smaller fragment fragment is removed but if it is running below the level of bone the alveolar bone adjacent then we have to think about the different options so we can go for the uh, by seeing the prognosis we can for, go for either the endodontic treatment whatever is needed or splinting or other treatment options can be explored if it is running below the level of bone so the question can be asked in which of the following conditions the fractured segment is removed that will be if the fracture segment the fracture line is running above the level of uh, bone pulp polyp pulp polyp is nothing but it is a chronic pulpitis itself and if the uh, chronic pulpitis is for longer duration or we can say when the pulp is highly reactive then uh, there is excessive proliferation in the pulp and it becomes more vascularized but the number of nerves are lesser and on manipulation also there is no pain so generally what happens there is a huge cavity in the tooth and you'll be able to clinically see the pulp which is highly proliferated and it seems like the pulp is coming out from the uh, uh, that particular defect of the cavity so this is generally seen in young adults and children's it can be seen in the primary molars it is frequently seen and it is also seen in the permanent first molars also so uh, when i say about the pulp pulp uh, polyp so it is nothing but chronic hyperplastic open pulpitis or sometimes we call it chronic hyperplastic pulpitis and it's found most commonly in deciduous molars and permanent first molars as i have already told now it is due to excessive exuberant proliferation of chronically inflamed pulp tissue and this is telling you the pathogenesis of the pulp polyp highly vascularized and the treatment option is just like as we do for the irreversible pulpitis we'll be going for the endodontic treatment for chronic pulpitis vertical root fracture it is one of the most difficult diagnosis to be made by an endodontist uh, but it can be easily found if we know certain characteristics of the vertical root fracture so first of all we'll be talking about the etiologies of the vertical root fractures uh, most commonly it is the iatrogenic cause and endodontic treatment is one of the most common reason for the vertical root fractures also then there can be other uh, causes for the vertical root fractures also that can be physical or traumatic injuries then if we leave the occlusal prematurities if you are not doing the proper occlusal finishing after restoring a tooth there are chances that the tooth opposite to that or the same tooth can get fractured vertically then repetitive parafunctional habits for heavy stressful chewing if the patient is having uh, parafunctional habits and he is stress, uh, increasing the occlusal load to the tooth then there are chances that the tooth may get fractured then resorption induced pathologic root fractures can also be uh, be a cause of vertical root fractures so the clinical features and diagnosis how it is made we'll be discussing it first of all the most common involved teeth is the mandibular second molar which is a very important question for the exam point of view the mandibular second molar is the most commonly involved teeth in vertical root fractures 
then we have selective sensitivity selective sensitivity will be there that means if you are percussing the tooth if you are checking the tenderness on percussion in a particular direction in that direction only it will be showing the pain to the percussion otherwise it won't be so this is known as the selective sensitivity so sensitivity when the tooth is percussed in a particular direction is known as the selective sensitivity which is a characteristic of vertical root fractures then we can also see the multiple sinus tracts which are present there in relation to the tooth with a vertical root fracture the best way to determine the presence of vertical root fracture is direct surgical exposure so when the question is asked how to check the vertical root fracture the direct surgical exposure is the best way to check it then there are other indication like cement trail so cement if you are filling a cement and that will be uh, extruding out in the gingival margin around the tooth that means there are chances that the cement is uh, like coming out from the fractured side and uh, that will be shown as radio opaque in radiograph so you can see the cement extrusion through radiograph and check it or diagnose it so cement trail that is cement extrusion through and out of the fracture site into the adjacent tissue after which it becomes visible through radiograph and which is more diffuse than the accessory canals now important point will be this the cement which is coming out of the crack will be more diffuse than the accessory canals again there is a characteristic bone loss with the vertical root fracture that is known as the halo like bone loss again this is a characteristic feature that the halo like bone loss is seen with vertical root fracture now let's discuss certain meritors prefects which are prepared for the exam point keeping the exam in mind so the acute exacerbation of chronic periapical abscess is known as phoenix abscess and this was a question asked in the previous neat examination also then sharp momentary pain stimulus and decreased threshold to electric stimulus is a characteristic feature of reversible pulpitis as we have already discussed in that particular section that the reversible pulpitis will be showing less threshold to the pain means uh, the uh, pain will be elicited even uh, then the lesser is stimuli than the normal pulp so at the lower temp uh, lower electric current the pain will be uh, elicited in reversible pulpitis tooth while in irreversible pulpitis cases there will be increased threshold of the pain to EPT electric pulp testing then the preferred temperature for heat test is 65.5 degrees Celsius the preferred temperature for cold test is 5 degrees Celsius and definite treatment of internal resorption which we have uh, just read now is just the pulpectomy you have to do the RCT of that particular tooth the optimum thickness of dentin remaining to protect from restorative material is 2 mm as we have already discussed the RDT is of three type there are three categories for the RDT first is less than first is more than 2 mm in which we don't require any uh, protection from the restorative material then comes the second category which will be 0.5 to 2 mm in which we need the uh, bandage of the dentinal tubules and then comes less than 0.5 mm where we need medicaments or pulp protectors like calcium hydroxide and MTA so what it is saying the optimum thickness of the dentin in which we don't require any restorative material protection so that is more than 2 mm the only sensation which a pulp can transmit is pain so pulp can just sense the pain then we have phantom tooth which is also known as the deafferentation then pain of dental origin is always on the single side on the same side where the uh, pathology is there and it never crosses the midline referred pain referred pain is a pain which is occurring at a site but it is not the site of the pathology that means if there is a pathology at some place and the pain due to that is at some other plane uh, other place that is known as the referred pain so the referred pain of myocardial origin is generally the lower jaw so that is called the referred pain there is no pathology in the lower jaw but still due to the heart myocardial infarction the pain is occurring inside the jaw so this is how the referred pain is 
discuss so referral site associated with tooth what are the referral sites so for the mandibular incisors the pulpitis if there is inflammation in the mandibular incisors the pain will be at mandibular frenum so patient might think that there is a pain in the mandibular frenum and still the uh, pulpitis is of mandibular incisors then we have pain of mandibular molars that is felt at the preauricular region or inside the ear so patient may be complaining of the pain in the preauricular region or at the inside the ear or mandibular third molar that will be occurring at the angle of the mandible somewhere here then we have the maxillary incisors will be paining in the supraorbital region that will be referring there then for the first molar and canine maxillary first molar and canine will be referring the pain towards the infraorbital region supraorbital is the incisors then the canine and first molars will be infraorbital and then maxillary second molar will be at preauricular region so these are the things which we have to revise and can be asked in exam here the patient asks pink tooth of memory so this is a terminology known as the pink tooth of memory and it is asking which is which statement is true about this now pink tooth of memory is basically the internal resorption or also known as the osteoclastoma so uh, we'll be seeing the looking with the at the each statement first is always asymptomatic so it is not necessary that it is always asymptomatic because pink tooth of memory is generally asymptomatic but if the infection or the inflammation reaches to the periapical area there are chances of having sensitivity or percussion so uh, or pain can also be there so it is not always asymptomatic then second statement is always iatrogenic it is not the case uh, although the etiology, correct etiology is unknown, but it is not always the case that it is caused by the clinician or the dentist itself. Then we have third statement that is the pulpotomy is the treatment of choice. No, we cannot uh, confirm that the only pulpotomy is required. Uh, generally, uh, treatment indicated for pink tooth of memory is RCT that is pulpectomy. So the fourth that is it is caused by osteoclast hence called as osteoclastoma as i have already discussed about the pathophysiology of this pink tooth of memory in this the inflammatory cells will be changed into osteoclast which will be doing the resorption from inside throughout the wall and will lead to the pink tooth of memory or the osteoclastoma and that's the reason the terminology osteoclastoma has been given to us so answer to this question will be four that is caused by osteoclast and called osteoclastoma this question is showing a figure and we have to identify the figure as we can see this is made up of plastic and there is a head of this area which is serrated here serrated head we can see here now this particular head is inserted in the occlusion and when there is a fracture in the tooth will be inserting it and uh, asking the patient to bite when the patient relieves the bite there is pain and that is the reason that is the diagnosis of the crack tooth syndrome so this particular thing is a frac finder used for checking the crack tooth syndrome so answer to this will be two that is frac finder now one of the most important question which is being asked about the vertical root fracture so the question here is which of the following is not a feature of VRF so we have to delineate the features of uh, vertical root fracture so the first uh, option is halo like bone loss yes we see the halo like bone loss in such uh, the radiographic appearance of uh, halo like bone loss is there then there is selective sensitivity selective sensitivity means uh, when we are uh, doing the percussion so in particular direction it is showing the sensitivity so that is also a feature of vrf then we have multiple sinus tract yes of course we can see the multiple sinus tracts in presence of vrf then there is a cement trail yes cement trail is something uh, if we are obturating or if we are putting cement inside the tooth canal and it is fractured so some cement will be coming out into the periradicular area of the, or it can come out from the gingival margins also and it can be seen through the uh, radiograph it is the if the cement is or the uh, whatever material we are obturating it with it will be uh, radio opaque so due to the radio opacity it will be showing a diffuse 
area of the fracture also. So answer to this will be all the four statements are true and these are the features of VRF. So none of the above is the correct answer to this.